Bienvenidos. Welcome, everyone, to our Latina Journeys in Animation artist panel with our lovely panelists. You are here rising, rising up early in the morning to rise up animated. <laughs> Buenos dias. Um, first, we have Jenny Salucido, um, who is a lead rigger at Cinecite Vancouver. We also have Ivette Bueno, who is a lead writer at DreamWorks Animation. We also have Monica Davila, who is a direct storyboard director, currently at Atomic Cartoons, and Seth Tomas Flores, who is an effects artist at DreamWorks Future Animation as well. I'm your moderator today, Maria Zeria, um, and I'm a production coordinator at DreamWorks Future Animation. And so we're gonna start it off with the hard hitting questions, um, having our panelists introduce themselves, um, tell us about their journeys, a little bit about their background, because some of them have traveled very far um, to get to where they are today. And I'm super like amazed by all of them. We're gonna start with Yves Bueno on Primero, if she wants to take it away. All right, so my name is Yvette Bueno. I am from Mexico, from many places in Mexico. I was born in one place, raised in another, studied in another, and everywhere. I'm a lead lighter at DreamWorks Animation. I have been there for almost five years, and I have been doing lighting for, I think, almost 13 years. I don't know. Don't make math. Don't make, don't do math. Make math. English. <laughs> I'm still young, <laughs> but that's me. Nice to meet Wait, you guys. <laughs> that makes you... 75? No, I think I'm almost 88. That's my abuela. In the same way, I'm going to be Five? No. Five grandchildren. <laughs> but yeah. Yves, Spanish, también. Introduce yourself in Spanish. I'm so Spanish, Spanish. perfect. My name is Yves Bueno. I'm so a lead, uh, lead lighter. Eh, líder en iluminación en DreamWorks. Soy de México, nací en varias, bueno, nací en Ciudad Juárez, crecí en Ensenada, California, viví en Guadalajara y tengo ahora aquí cinco años en, ya en DreamWorks. Awesome. Nice. We're gonna, nice. We're gonna popcorn it over to Jenny. You want to introduce yourself, tell us a, little, a bit about your journey in English y en español también. Okay, perfect. Well, yeah, my name is Jenny Salcido. I'm originally from Durango, Mexico. And um, yeah, I've been in animation, well, in rigging especially, uh, since about like 10 years or so, plus 10 years, same, don't do math. And um, yeah, um, I currently work at a lead rigger at Cinecide, and I'm uh, uh, currently located in Vancouver. And in Spanish now? Okay. Yeah. Hola, mi nombre claro. es uh, Jenny Salcido. Yo soy de Durango, Durango, México. Eh, me especializo en el área de rigging. Y um, tengo trabajando en el área de animación más o menos unos 10 años, poquito más, poquito menos. Um, eh, actualmente trabajo como lead rigger en Cinesite y vivo en la ciudad de Vancouver, Canadá. Ooh, gracias por eso. Uh, we're going to head over to Seth Tomás para hablar tu nombre y um, de dónde vienes. Vienes. <laughs> Very broken Spanish as well, Maya. Uh, you want to introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about yourself and your journey in English y español también, por favor. Sure. Hi. How are you, everybody? Um, I was born and raised in Mexico City. Um, I lived also in several places in Mexico, also in Guadalajara. And... Um, yeah, uh, I studied graphic design and somehow I, well, I studied architecture first and then graphic design and then art history and somehow I ended up making animation and effects. And right now I'm living in Los Angeles and yeah, working in DreamWorks. Okay, awesome. And, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, sorry, Spanish. Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, hola, uh, soy este Thomas. Yo nací en México, en la Ciudad de México, y viví en varias partes de México. Y um, estudié diseño gráfico, arquitectura, historia del arte, y terminé haciendo animación. Y pues ahorita estoy aquí en Los Ángeles trabajando en efectos para DreamWorks. Hey. 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 <laughs> Everything sounds Monica, much cooler oh. in Spanish. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> it's a secret. You, you haven't heard me try Spanish yet, Bobby. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Monica, we're in this together. All right. <laughs> take it away, Monica, your turn. <laughs> okay. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Monica Davila, and I am a storyboard director at Atomic Cartoons. And let's see, I've been, I grew up in California, born and raised, but my parents are from Bolivia. 
Um, hence why I know a little bit of Spanish. Um, I actually did not go to art school. I went to UCLA and graduated in 2013 with a degree in political science. Um, but I loved animation. So I was an intern at Nickelodeon. And then from there went on to be a production assistant and then jumped over to storyboards and started directing about two years ago. So yeah. Um, all right, now for the Spanish. All right. Um, hola, soy Monica. Soy um, director de storyboards at Atomic Cartoons. Um, yo nació aquí in California, in Los Angeles, in Burbank. Um, y fui a UCLA a estudiar a ciencia política. Um, y después fui a trabajar a Nickelodeon y Paramount Animation, DreamWorks Television Animation, Disney Television Animation. Um, y eso es todo. <laughs> ah, bueno. Hey. Yay. Yay. <laughs> great panel, guys. I'm excited. Thank you so much for taking the time. Gracias por todo para hacer eso. Um, first, we're going to kick it off with the next hard hitting question. What drew you to animation? ¿Por qué estás haciendo animación? So, Jenny, si quieres empezar juntos, if you want to take it away first. Um, how did I start an animation? Well, um... Or what drew you to it? Like, what inspired you? What drew me to it? Well, it, it, it was funny because uh, normally, you know, all the artists I know that are involved in animation, they have like this story where like as soon as they saw like Toy Story or when I watched like Jurassic Park, I fell in love with it and I knew that I wanted to do that. For me, it wasn't like that. Um, I, I used to love all the animated movies, of course, like I had all of them and watched them uh, like many, many times a day. But I never realized that that could be a job. <laughs> like, I didn't know that you could do that for a living. So I never considered animation as, um, as a career until I was actually studying um, communication. That was my degree. And um, in that, I had like two things that kind of drew me to animation. It, one was like, I, I, I had two animation um, classes in my, in my um, during university and I loved it and um, yeah I was starting to try to integrate that in all my other uh, classes and assignments like even if I had like a I don't know philosophy or um, other type of um, assignment I will say like oh can I do an animation instead of like an essay because I, I loved it so much and uh, it was just like 2D animation more like um, uh, After Effects and Flash and all that, but that's how I discovered that that could be something that I that I could do for a living. And also, there was one um, e event in uh, Monterrey, Mexico. It was called Forum, uh, and the, it was like a week of uh, different talks about different topics. And one of the talks happened to be like. Um, a group of guys, they were doing like, um, like animation um, lessons or classes. They, they used to go to like little towns in Mexico um, and uh, teach indigenous kids how to animate like 2D animation. And they will do like tell stories about like their, their cultural background, like maybe legends or something that they, they know as kids and they will uh, tell the stories uh, of, of those, um, uh, yeah, of, of like their, their uh, heritage in, in these animated short films. And they, they show the project, they show like how they did the lessons and they show some of the little shorts and I just fell in love with it. Like I, I knew that how powerful that, that tool was, that media was. And I just wanted to do that. I decided that I wanted to be involved in telling stories, especially for kids. Like it was more the animated, cartoony um, style of it that caught my eye, not really the, the BFX side of it. It was more like I wanted to work in movies for kids and tell stories to kids. That's what I wanted to do. And that's how I got involved in, um, in this um, animation world. Awesome. You want to try that in Spanish? <laughs> <laughs> I don't have to, but... <laughs> yeah, well, in Spanish, eh, más fácil. <laughs> eh, pues, 
Sí, uh, prácticamente yo no tuve así como la historia de, oh, cuando vi Toy Story o cuando vi um, Jurassic Park, supe desde niño que quería ser animadora. Yo me encantaban esta, este tipo de películas y las veía todo el tiempo, pero como que no agarraba la onda de que esto podría ser un trabajo. Yo solo, para mí era como magia, era mágico y no tenía idea de que había personas haciéndolo. Yo solo creía que pues ahí aparecían los, los, los dibujos y a mí me encantaban. Y me di cuenta que era un trabajo hasta que estaba en la universidad estudiando animación, no, no animación, estudiando comunicación. Y entonces llevaba dos clases de animación que fueron como empecé a descubrir este mundo y vi que era pues un trabajo posible y me daban clases de Flash y After Effects. Entonces así comencé a introducirme en el mundo de la animación y después fui a un evento que se llama Forum de las Culturas en Monterrey, México que son una serie de, de pláticas de distintos temas. Y en una de esas pláticas había un grupo de jóvenes que llevaban, uh, daban clases de animación a pequeñas comunidades indígenas, básicamente a niños, y los enseñaban a, a animar en 2D con dibujos y a contar historias como leyendas de, 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 que eran parte de su cultura, historias que ellos querían contar. Y me pareció fantástico, me pareció un, una herramienta súper poderosa y así fue como decidí pues invol eh, involucrarme en este mundo de la animación. Hey, gracias por eso, porque la gente que está viendo me gusta mucho que estás hablando en español. So, yeah. we're going to do both if we can. Yeah. Um, we're gonna, yeah, we're going to take it away to Steph. Um, if you want to tell us what inspired you into, to go into animation, que es tu inspiración para hacer animación. Sure. So, um, well, um, my story started, I think, when I was seven years, officially maybe earlier, but when I was seven years, I started studying uh, classic, classical ballet and, uh, and painting. And yeah, I never stopped painting since then. And uh, yeah, I think that's, that's what, what brought me to this. But um, yeah, At one point, I wasn't sure what to do, so I started studying architecture, which gave me a lot of technical uh, way, ways of thinking. Then I didn't like it, of course, so I, I moved to uh, graphic design, and um, yeah, that made more sense, but not that much. <laughs> so then I took another uh, like two-year specialization in animation, which I liked, and then Yeah, after that, I started, I started uh, working in motion graphics, first for the United Nations, because I, I wanted to do a change in the world and such. And uh, yeah, after that, I just did a lot of commercials. And then I moved to, I, I, I am not a fan of doing commercials, so I, I started uh, working in, um, I started making uh, projection mapping, and I did, some projects that I really loved and I'm proud of, which is uh, in, in Teotihuacan. We did a, a huge projection mapping from, uh, for the Sun Pyramid. And then in um, Chichen Itza for, well, yeah, the, the main pyramid in, in Chichen Itza. And then um, after that, I went to study uh, another specialization in, in um, effects, which is what I do right now. And uh, Yeah, that brought me here. I worked in a couple of studios here in LA, and yeah, right now I'm in, in DreamWorks making effects. And uh, in Spanish. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Um, yeah. yeah, that's great. Okay, so uh, yeah. mm, the same thing in Spanish. <laughs> so, uh, um, pues sí, empecé a los, como a los siete años um, uh, con clases de ballet y de, de pintura. Y después, uh, bueno, pues nunca dejé de pintar. Después estudié eh, un poquito de arquitectura que no me gustó. Después me mudé a, a, a diseño gráfico, que tampoco fui completamente fan. Entonces tomé una especialización de dos años en, en animación uh, tradicional y digital en 3D con Maya. Y después uh, entré a trabajar a la ONU haciendo motion graphics. Después 
um, hice muchísimos comerciales en diferentes estudios en México y después empecé a hacer uh, projection, map, uh, projection mapping o video mapping para distintos monumentos en, en, en México y dos de las, de las uh, video mappings que más me gustaron o de las que estoy muy orgullosa de haber participado son um, en la pirámide del de, de sol de Teotihuacán y en Chichen Itza, que les recomiendo muchísimo ir a verlo, es una experiencia maravillosa. Y bueno, de ahí me fui a hacer otra especialización en efectos y um, después me vine para acá y he trabajado en un par de estudios antes de, de, de trabajar aquí en, en donde estoy en DreamWorks haciendo efectos. Uh, awesome. We're going to head it back over to Yvette. Si quieres hablar de que tu, que tu, fue tu inspiración para hacer animación, it would have started to get the animation. Perfect, inspiration. So I think my, my path was a little bit more traditional uh, compared to you guys. I think you guys have been doing different things, which is great. <clears throat> As many people, I started drawing when I was like a baby, I guess. My mom would be like, okay, do something, be busy, right? So I wouldn't be annoying. <laughs> So I started drawing when I was a kid, but I come from a family that uh, they're really, my dad, he's a physicist or he, well, he's a programmer and physicist and he's into science and science is really important. So I thought I was going to study biology because I really love biology, mainly um, anything um, in relationship with the deep animals, you know, like all the medusas in the deep sea. So I love that. And actually, they had their own lighting. So I, I felt like something around there was going on. But I, I feel bad because I know for a lot of people like Jurassic Park or Toy Story were the, the movies that changed their mind. I want to say mine, but please promise people to not laugh because it's really bad. <laughs> but if any of, of you work on that, I really need an, uh, an autograph. So the movie that changed my life was actually Mortal Kombat. Oh, wow. <laughs> the first one, that one from 1998 <laughs> or five. So I went to the cinema and I had in my mind, I'm going to be a biologist because my dad wants to be, wants me to be a biologist. But then I saw the, who was it like, don't even remember, reptile of, sub, I think it was the reptile guy or sub-zero, one of those two. I think the reptile guy had like this snake coming from his hand and I was like, Wow, I want to have that power. <laughs> so I thought, instead of studying the animals, what if I create them? Like, what if I look the way to do that? And I didn't even know how to get there or if that was possible because, again, Mexico, like, is rare if you, back then, right, 1998, we didn't have a lot of industry or any, maybe. So time passed, I talked to my dad and say, hey dad, guess what? I'm not going to be a biologist. I'm going to do drawings and animation. My mom was happy because she was a graphic designer back then. But my dad was like, what? How dare you? <laughs> so at the end, well, as a, Mexi a, a smaller Mexican family, I actually left home and be like, bye. They told me, if you leave this place and you st don't study what I want, you're on your own. And I was like, yeah, sure, fine, let's do this. <laughs> So I went to study Guadalajara, and in Guadalajara, um, I mean, my, my mom supported me a lot, so that was good. I mean, my dad supports me now, so that's, that's good. Um, so over there, I thought I was going to do animation, because when I dis when after I saw the movie, I actually started doing animations for Newgrounds in Flash, because Flash was a big thing back then. So <clears throat> I was doing animation, so when I arrived to Guadalajara, I actually started doing like studying animation because I did study animation it was uh, of the career animation digital art and multimedia mm -hmm. and before that I studied cinema and animation but then I moved to another school when I was studying I realized that I'm the worst animator <laughs> like the worst and the funny thing is is that I am really like hyperactive and I have a lot of faces and things but a lot of people think I'm an animator it's like no so I think what happened is that when I was work, I worked with my mom a little bit in her graphic design her studio. I used to do like small compositions in photo, Photoshop, not Photoshop, was the photo paint from CorelDRAW. 
So I realized that that translated really good to compositing. So I started doing a lot of compositing at, at school and then some teachers saw that and they tried to like mentor me between compositing and lighting. So that's how I ended up being in lighting and I love it because just the idea of making an image look in, in a certain way was just like so exciting for me. So now in Spanish, huh? <laughs> All right, so ahí les va. Pues yo cuando estaba, yo empecé mi carrera muy, muy tradicionalmente, o sea, yo creo que se parece muchísimo a la de muchos de ustedes. Yo dibujé desde chiquita y de ahí pues se fue dando, ¿no? Pero yo cuando estaba como en la primaria, por ahí, secundaria, yo quería estudiar biología, porque mi papá viene de, mi papá es físico, matemático, no sé qué, programador, de, de todo le pica ahí. <ríe> y mi mamá estudió diseño, bueno, ella tenía su despacho de diseño gráfico. Entonces... Yo iba a estudiar biología, especializada en la zona abismal, porque me encantaban las medusitas, esas que estaban yendo en el agua con las luces y todo. Y decía yo, qué chido están esas medusas. El detalle fue que una vez fuimos al cine, cuando por ahí del 98, 95, me acuerdo, a ver la película de Combat Mortal. Muchos dicen que empezaron su carrera cuando vieron Jurassic Park o Toy Story o una de esas películas que se ven bien padres con los efectos. Pero no. Yo me motivé porque vi a, a, rep, a Reptil, ay, no me acuerdo cómo se llama ese monito, sacar una víbora de su mano y dije, no manches, yo quiero hacer eso. Entonces dije, en vez de, de estudiar los animales, ¿por qué no veo la manera de crearlos? No van a decir que tengo complejo de, de otra cosa. El caso es que después pues hablé con mis papás, ya que estaba un poquito más grande, y les dije, ¿saben qué? Pues es que no quiero estudiar biología. Quiero hacer películas, la verdad no tengo ni idea porque en México, pues olvídate, es una, hace una cosa extraña, ¿verdad? Y ya terminando ahí, pues mi papá me dijo, pues si no estudias lo que, tú, lo que yo quiero, pues que vengo de una familia tradicional. Le digo, ahorita ya no son tanto. Me dijeron, no, pues bye, va sola. Entonces pues dije, vámonos, pues ahí se ven, <ríe> yo quiero estudiar eso, le voy, a, le voy a llevar. Vamos a ver qué pasa, ¿no? De ahí, pues, con el apoyo de mis papás, al final me apoyaron. Este, me fui a Guadalajara, empecé a estudiar cine y animación. De ahí me pasé a animación, arte digital y multimedia. Y estando ahí, porque como también trabajé con mi mamá, haciendo composiciones en su despacho de diseño gráfico, al llegar a la carrera, eso se parecía mucho a la parte de compositing. Entonces, ahí ya muchos maestros vieron como, pues, que estaba yo ahí de, de, de clavada, de, quedándome en la escuela muy tarde. Y de ahí me empezaron a, a dar mentorías para iluminación y composición. Y ya, así. Ya, esto es te cierto, necesitas empezar con otro algo y van a hacer animación. Sí. <laughs> For in English, that's the secret apparently, is you all start in something else and then we go into animation. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to yeah. pop over to Monica if you want to take it away. All right. Okay, so let's see. I, so I did draw a lot as a kid. I grew up drawing all the time and my parents are really great about it, like, super encouraging and, you know, gave me all the paper and the crayons and everything in the house, to just go to town on it. Um, but I grew up in Orange County, California, um, which is extremely suburban. Um, and that was great. And we had some really good schools there, like really, really good schools. So I was really fortunate um, to get a really good education. But the emphasis was on like the traditional kind of schooling. It was on Um, you know, math, science, uh, government, all that stuff, not so much art. So I didn't really get exposed to a lot of like animation stuff aside from watching movies as a kid. Um, and then what made me want to go into it as an actual career, um, and same like uh, Yvette, who was saying that, <laughs> don't give a crap for this. So like, don't give me crap for this, please. <laughs> Feel free to, but like, um, it was watching Cars in from Pixar like that came out when I was in high school and I was in all of these like AP classes just like constantly and so that was it was nice to watch a movie and be like oh here's a you know main character who is so like similar to me where it's like it's constantly just about like one goal and that's all I want and then realizing like well there's actually like maybe a little bit more to life at this point because in order to do all those AP classes I had stopped drawing Um, as much as I used to. So I got back into it after watching the movie and I was like, oh, I can't believe like a movie can like make you relate so much to it. I really want to do that. How do I do that? So I started like looking at animation and being like, who are the people that make these movies? 
Um, and so when I was in high school, I ended up going to Cal Arts for a summer session um, called CISA. And when I was there, I learned a little bit more about storyboarding. And that's where I learned like, oh, like you can tell a whole story visually and that's like your job. Um, which like blew my mind because I don't think I have the patience to be an animator and animate one shot. Like, cause I would just be like, oh my God, I just wanna be rough and loose with everything. Um, so then I still wasn't sure though. Like, did I want to, cause I, I loved academic stuff too. So I was like, do I want to go to a traditional four year college and be a lawyer? Which is what I had told my family I was going to do. Or did I want to go into animation? Did I want to try to like apply for Cal Arts and like see if I could go that way? Um, so actually like we had like a career day like a college day kind of thing at the end of the session and ucla was one of the universities there and they were like oh we have both like we have an animation program but we also have like political science and um you know that kind of academic stuff balanced out and so i was like oh that's awesome so i ended up going to ucla for my undergraduate um degree and while i was there I was a political science major because you couldn't apply for the film program until your last two years. So I was like, well, I'll just try to like get my stuff out of the way for poli sci first and then I'll apply. And if I get in, I'll switch my degree over. Um, so I ended up being an intern in the meantime um, in the US Senate. Um, so I flew to DC as an intern in Congress. Um, and I was like, I don't think I want to do this. because <laughs> I like went and I was like, they were sending me to meetings and stuff. And I kept drawing in all the meetings, like in the margins of like my notes and everything. So I was like, I think I really just want to go into animation. So when I came back, I got, um, and one of my professors for this animation class I took, who later ended up being my director at DreamWorks. So it's a very small world. Um, he worked on the Simpsons. So I was an intern on the Simpsons my junior year. And then one of my production managers from the Simpsons used to work at Nickelodeon. So when my internship ended on Simpsons, he was like, well, where do you want to intern next? And I was like, oh, I really want to like intern at Nick because I heard their internship program is really good. But every time I applied, I got rejected. So like I'd gotten like rejected from Nick and DreamWorks. So I was like, I don't know, maybe like I'll just maybe I don't know if I should or shouldn't. Um, so he recommended me for the internship program. Um, so on my fourth try, I got into the Nick internship program my senior year of college and I was an intern on Dora the Explorer and that's where I actually got to see like real life storyboards like television storyboards and what the job actually entailed and as an intern we got access to practice tests and all that stuff so I learned like what a storyboard test was and I had to show my art and like get feedback and so that's really where like I learned a lot of art stuff because I didn't go to school for art so it was like getting that training at Nick which was a really really good experience and when I graduated I was going to get my master's in animation at UCLA. I got into the program. Um, but the day after I told them, yes, I would go, I got, I had interviewed at Paramount Animation for a PA position on SpongeBob 2. And like two days after I said yes to UCLA, I got the offer to be a PA at Paramount. So I called UCLA back and was like, I'm not going to go to grad school. I'm going to go be a production assistant. And I started working there um, a little bit before graduation. And then a few months into that, we needed more character layout artists on the movie. And I had taken one of the tests for practice. So I turned in my test and then they made me the freelance character layout artist on top of being a PA. So my title in the movie ended up being character layout apprentice, which is pretty cool. Um, and then when the movie was getting close to ending, a friend from Nick was like, oh, we need a storyboard revisionist at Nickelodeon. So I tested and after a couple tests, I got in. So I was a revisionist for six months on Wally -E Kazam, and then I got bumped up to boards. And then I boarded on Wally, -E, I boarded on Shimmer and Shine, um, boarded on Big Hero 6 the series, and then boarded at DreamWorks um, on Rocky and Bullwinkle and Archibald. And I had told people I wanted to direct. So then that's how I got the call to come back to Nick and direct. Um, on Santiago the Seas, which premieres next week. So I'm very, very excited about that. Um, so yeah, so that's, that is my story. All that in Spanish now. Okay, I will try my shorten best. Shorten if you need um, to, yeah. <laughs> I will shorten it um, with my, one of the AP classes I took in high school, ironically, was Spanish. <laughs> Did I do well in it? Maybe. Um, <laughs> I passed my AP test. Um, that was a long time ago. Um, 
So, oh boy, let's see. Uh, me gustaba dibujar cuando era una, una niña y um, mi mamá y papá estaban muy, muy orgullosos, ¿cómo se dice? Orgullosos de que podía hacer eso, pero um, yo creo que no era hasta que fui, que fui a ver Cars um, en secundaria que yo pensó puedo hacer eso, yo quiero trabajar en animación. Um, y fui a CalArts para un um, programa que se llamaba CISA, y ahí um, fue yo, ¿cómo se dice? Aprendió uh, cómo dibujar storyboards, y que era un storyboard, y um, que eso era algo que um, podías hacer en animación, no solamente um, como animator, pero eso era un trabajo muy específico. Um, y después fui a UCLA para estudiar uh, ciencia política y fui a Washington, D.C. para mi internship en um, in el Senate. Y sabía que no quería hacer eso por, um, por vida, porque no era, no era muy interesante para mí. Um, so, cuando yo volvió a California, um, fui a hacer un internship en los Simpsons y después a Nickelodeon um, y los artistas me, um, como, podía, como dice, they were like mentors um, para mí. Y um, aprendió así en Nickelodeon y después fui a trabajar a Paramount Animation um, y Fui a hacer freelance on SpongeBob 2 y después de eso fui a Nickelodeon para hacer um, storyboard revisions y después um, subió a storyboard artist y trabajó on Shimmer and Shine and Big Hero 6 y um, después fui a DreamWorks y and cuando estuve a DreamWorks me llamado otra vez por de Nickelodeon para preguntar si quería ser um, director de storyboards para Santiago um, y fui a hacer eso. Y ahora estoy a uh, Atomic Cartoons, a uh, storyboard director. Yeah, there's my Cliff Notes version of it. <laughs> Woo, no fue muy bueno, it went really well. Now, hey, great. Is, now Bobby in Spanish. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Great. Monica, amazing. <laughs> uh, Scott, uh, Jenny, uh, Ivan, uh, Eva. <laughs> Yvette. 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 It's fine. I have many names. Yeah, and Maria. Yeah. So. Oh my goodness. Now, speaking of all of your guys' journeys, you guys all seem to start um, somewhere different. And we have a great question from the audience that's close to the, related to this topic. Um, did you guys, um, were you guys scared when you changed careers that you said you wanted to be in animation? You know, you already talked about your motivation. Could you talk about a bit of that either fear or, you know, or that gung ho attitude? Um, but, muy emocionada que cuando estás cambiando, um, oh my goodness, tu, my God, tu trabajo, estás cambiando tu trabajo, que estás estudiando, um, que fue la motivación para hacer este sueño. Um, we want to start with Seth, if you want to tell us a little bit about if you were scared to make the change, fue miedo. Um, yeah, well, I'm not sure how that, how everything happened. <laughs> I think just like, took me there because yeah when I was studying graphic design I was not happy studying the, well first architecture like I, I no I don't like architecture at all but then I, I moved to change to graphic design and it was not enough as well and then um yeah I was like okay I'm gonna make something out of these I have to use it so I, I went to work at United Nations And I was not doing a lot of animation. It was motion graphics, but it was not like super cool motion graphics or something. It was more like presentations for governments and stuff like that. And it was like, uh, so then, um, yeah, I think life just took me there uh, to start working in, in, I started working in commercials and I, I didn't like that. And then, yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure. It just it just it just happened. Yeah. <laughs> And in español, um, pues sí, o sea, uh, 
simplemente sucedió, no sé cómo la vida, la vida me, me, me llevó. Bueno, I didn't say this in English, but uh, yeah, I, I love the, like uh, dancing and painting and putting that together. I think it's something that always like moved me or, or that I always loved. And then, yeah, and in español, um, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm all confused now. <laughs> <laughs> no, es, es okay. bueno porque en español solamente es it, it, it happens, you know. Ya, yeah. ya qué pasa. I think that's what a lot of a lot of us, you know, cuando antes hablas en otro algo y ya necesitas hacer haces. <laughs> that's pretty much what it is. Um, I can leave this one open ended to anyone who wants to answer it, just because I know um, we've all kind of covered it already. But if anyone has any wants to shout out a point of their motivation or anything that stood out. I mean, I think for me, it was, it was definitely scary because I, you know, I couldn't, I was expected to go into a more traditional field. Um, I was surrounded by people who were in more traditional fields. And so for me, going into the art field was something that, you know, I didn't see a lot around me. So it was really hard um, trying to figure out how to do it. And, and I felt like I didn't have any ideas. So it was a lot of like, self-motivation like having to be like I have to go online and google this because I have absolutely no clue like how you even begin like what is a portfolio like what goes into a portfolio um but I will say I was extremely fortunate because I straight up told my parents when I was going to pick UCLA um because I had also gotten into Cornell um for undergrad so I which I was really proud of I was really excited about it um But I told them, I was like, look, I can go to this really great school um, on the East Coast, but I also want, and it was an Ivy League and everything, which is, you know, kind of what was like expected of um, like my class and stuff. But I was like, I really, you know, UCLA is also a really good school. So like, I want to stay here. I want to go and study um, political science, but I want to, I think I might want to go into animation, but I still want to go study political science because I'm not sure. And I think I was really fortunate that my parents were willing to basically like send me to college to get a degree that I might not use. <laughs> um, because my dad looked at it this way. He's like, you need a backup plan. So he's like, we'll support you to go, you know, to college, go wherever you want, but just get a degree in something that's not animation, like just in case, because you don't know. Um, so it was scary. You know, I mean, part of it was buffered by the fact that I knew like, okay, if I, I have a fallback plan, um, But it was terrifying to be like, I could graduate and have no freaking clue like what to do. So it was something that, you know, I think from a point of privilege, I was very, very lucky that I had that because not everyone has that option. Um, but what's nice about now is that there are all these resources online and you don't have to go to art school. You don't have to go to a traditional four year college. Um, you can go and take a class at CDA, you can do schoolism, you can do all these things. And that kind of gives you more of an idea of like what animation is rather than going in more blindly. But yeah, it is terrifying. Yeah, you said it's really great. Okay, go ahead, take it away, Jenny. Yeah, I, I just can relate to you uh, what uh, Monica was saying, because for me it was sort of similar. Like what I wanted to do originally was theater. That's what I wanted to be. Like, I just wanted to do theater for life. And uh, my mom kind of said the same thing. Like, oh, okay, I support you, you know, but you need like a backup plan. Like, you cannot just be an artist and hope that, you know, life will provide for you, which it has so far. And um, I said, okay, you know, like get a different degree that is not theater and then if when you're done, you want to still do theater, then I support you and then you can do that. But um, I, I kind of cheated a little bit because I chose um, communication, which is like a degree that is kind of a little bit of everything. Like it had, because um, um, I was also in a radio station. So um, communication has like all that, you know, it's kind of like you get some media classes, but also some like Um, theater classes, but also some design related classes and video editing, sound editing, and like um, animation and all that. So it was like a mix. So for me, it was a good period to try a little bit of everything. And then I kind of like, I liked all of it. I liked uh, video editing. I like um, everything, even philosophy that we, we had some lessons 
um, on finals. I love all of it. But when I started like taking the animation lessons, it was a complete different feeling. Like it just blew me away. So I didn't hesitate to like decide this is what I want to do because it just like the feeling, it was completely different to everything else. Everything else, I liked it and I enjoyed doing it, but animation was different. It was like a passion, you know, just like a complete different feeling. So I didn't hesitate to like, once I discovered it, I straight away went for it because it, um, yeah, nothing ever like give me that passion, passionate feeling that animation gave me. And I think for me it was the opposite completely, which is another point of view. <laughs> because I think for me what happened is that I didn't have any backup plan. I mean, I didn't have any other career. I just, I mean, I went a little bit wrong with my family and I said, I want to study that. So I jumped out of the nest and I say, bye guys, I'm going to study this. And that's the only thing I have. And I currently have. I mean, hopefully now I'm smarter and older and I can just take backup plans right out of my pockets. <laughs> but I think what happened to me was that I didn't have anything extra, so I needed to make it work or I needed to make it work. And mainly because even if my mom and my dad, maybe I'm like, probably they're there in the conference. Hello, parents. <laughs> they actually supported me. I mean, again, me being jumping out of the nest was like a big thing. And I knew that I couldn't just come back and say, oh, it didn't work. So that was a huge motivation for me. Plus, as Jenny was saying, and also Monica, is that I already had tried a little bit while I was in middle school and high school because I used to do it on my own time. Like, instead of going outside with friends, which I kind of did, but not always, I stay at home animating because I just love. It was my safe zone. It was my personal space. And I was just, believe me, guys, there will be days that I wouldn't even, I will go down, eat with my parents, and then go up and be animating because that was my, my place, even if I don't animate right now. <laughs> But I mean, anything that had to do with the arts. I used to paint, draw, animate, anything. Even I play a little with 3D stuff. So when I decided to go to school, it was like, okay, I need to make this work or I need to make this work. And something that I tell everybody about the motivating moment is that, you know, you, you already, it's not that you have lost everything, but it's like you don't have anything in your hands. So just try it. You know, it's like you're not going to lose because you don't have it. So if you, but what I'm saying about like opportunities and things like that is just try it because you never know what's going to happen. Um, and really fans in Spanish, yo creo que como ellas, este, yo tuve una, una carrera diferente porque yo no tenía nada más que animación. Yo no estudié otra carrera ni nada por el estilo, entonces sí fue como de me tengo que aventar porque me tengo que aventar porque no tengo un plan B ni tanto soporte para hacer otra cosa. Y eso fue lo que me ayudó muchísimo en la parte de motivación. Sí, es la verdad, you know, a lot of our, I think we've heard from our either parents or family is, you know, you have to have the guts to do it, y en el pueblo también, necesitas hacer las ganas para hacer, you know, at the end of the day, like, if it's something you want, like, my, you know, my mother and mi abuela um, told me as well, you know, if you're going to do it, go all in, like, don't beat around the bush, don't give it halfway, like, necesitas hacer, you need to do it, like, right the first time, and so, you can try, you may fail at something, but as long as you get back up, estás bien, it's all about how you get back up. You know, awesome. it's what they say, like, you fail, you just have to, like, ouch, 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 and then keep going. I don't know how to say this in yeah. English, but. <laughs> no, it's the same way, you know, like, for your parents, if you get hurt or something, they're like, why are you crying? You just get up and do it. Like, <laughs> Awesome. So the next question is, do you find yourself bringing your heritage into work, into your work, and what are your biggest influences as well? Um, there we go. Um, you guys can also shorten the Spanish if you'd like, or you don't have to do Spanish. I can also help summarize it up, um, just if it's becoming too much as a head nod. <laughs> All right, that's um, actually good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Monica, if you want to take it away and start us off, um, you bring yeah. your, your heritage into your work. Um, it's funny because, like, kind of in a way, yes and no. Um, so when I work on the episodes for a TV show, like I'm working with a script that's already written. Um, so for me, I'm just trying to put the story on screen or like guide my board team to get that story on screen. And the thing with me, with my heritage was growing up. Um, so like I said, my parents are from Bolivia. So my family is Bolivian, but I grew up here. 
So I was very Americanized. Um, my childhood was very, very, um, like my school was predominantly white. Um, like I didn't really, I spoke Spanish at home, um, but not a lot. Most of the times my parents would talk to me in English. Um, so for me, it was a little bit like, it's funny working on shows like Santiago, I had to relearn a little bit about my heritage. So like I would, like I noticed things on Santiago that I thought were great. Like Nikki Lopez was our show creator and she's amazing and was so um, dedicated to making that show feel authentic. She didn't want anyone's culture to feel like we were just using it as a, you know, like just, just a story point of like, oh, we're trying to make a show that's diverse. So let's just, you know, kind of just be like, yeah, we have this like, you know, Caribbean culture, Puerto Rican, but not really dive into it. She really wanted it to be authentic and, you know, interwoven with the story and move the story forward. So a lot of that came down into the pronunciation of the words because there are Spanish words in the show. Mm -hmm. So like I noticed those things and I was like, oh, like this line is said properly. Like, so then, but then it would be, I'd be like, I wonder how like, cause Spanish isn't the same in every single country. Um, Spanish spoken in Mexico is different than Spanish spoken in Bolivia. Um, and it's different than Spanish spoken in Spain. So I'd like call my parents and be like, how does this work? Like, is this, is this really how you say it? Cause I haven't heard it pronounced like this before. And so then we would like talk about it. And it was interesting to see like how, you know, that we were getting it right, which was nice. But there were moments I did have to call my parents occasionally and be like, I need to translate a word real fast. Can you like help me figure out if I'm saying or doing this right? Um, so that's a little bit where my heritage came into play, but on a, on, that's like on a more specific note, but on a broader note, for me, I just always want to try to make sure that any characters, whether or not they're like the same culture that I'm from, are not done falsely, that they're done properly. So that was a big thing on all the shows, like just to be like, all right, if this character is supposed to be representing this certain culture, is this correct? You know, are we doing this the right way? Um, so that's something I, I feel like I look out for more now, like just as someone who has seen their culture represented correctly and very incorrectly on screen. Yep. Yeah. I definitely do. Like, todo lo que estás haciendo en el trabajo es muy diferente y estás diferente porque estás haciendo una visión de otra persona. Pero cuando haces una visión que, porque una persona que, Esa es una cultura diferente como latino o, o otra cosa. Quieres proteger la auténtica de la cultura. I think we're good. Oh, yeah, no, but you did, you did do a really good point. Is, you know, sometimes the work doesn't have the culture in it, but there is, are moments in time. Si tienes momentos en el tiempo que you can actually give your input and make sure everything's checked. And uh, tu conexión con tus papás, like your connection with your parents, is also really good as well because it also kind of helps you, helps them understand what you're doing as well. Yeah. And we did have a question from the audience um, was, you know, how do you deal with bridging that gap with your parents? And like Monica just explained, you know, you bridge that gap by giving more explanation of what you do, you know, bringing them in like Monica did, um, asking for help, you know, if necessary to explain things or, you know, just panels like this, puedo ver um, panales like, as, como así, um, para dar la información para tu papá. You can show them panels like this um, just to give them more information on what's going on and what jobs are at, um, are out there, because sometimes that's the only thing they need is just a reference point and to see that people are doing these jobs. So that's really important. So I love that you brought up some great points, Monica. I want to kick it off to Jenny. If you want to let us know how your heritage may influence your work, whether personal or at work. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm a rigging artist. Mm -hmm. So as a rigging artist, rigging is a bit one of the most technical sides mm -hmm. of animation. So. Um, unfortunately, I don't have the, the, the um, opportunity to like creatively bring like my my heritage into it, but a little bit. Like I think I still do. And uh, one way of that is like I don't know if uh, everyone is familiar with it, but with this term. But for the ones that aren't, uh, there's a term called Mexicanada, which is uh, it, it it pretty much. Um, Sometimes it has a bad connotation, but that's not what I mean. Like, what I mean is, like, for me, a Mexicanada is, like, um, the way that we kind of, like, solve problems creatively without any previous knowledge or education or, on anything related to that problem that we're facing. So I think that this is the way I bring um, 
my my heritage or my cultural background in my job because on a daily basis uh, you face you face these challenges you know in, in, in each project there's a unique character that does something crazy like transform into this crazy thing and um, you face these challenges that you've never faced before and you have no clue how to solve it. And it's not like you can go to the textbook or to like a tutorial or something and say like, oh, how do I transform a character into this crazy monster or something? Like there's no written rules for that. So you, you literally have nothing and all you have is your creativity and you have to come up with a solution no matter what, right? So I feel that that's how... Um, yeah, like as a Mexican, um, you kind of have that in your genes already. It's part of your culture, you know, because you face, um, you, we, we grew up a, a bit more limited than um, most of the other people that are a bit more fortunate. Like we have limitations of, I don't know, money and like many other things, right? But you still kind of have to make your own way to achieve your dreams and your goals and everything and this way is very creative and very different because you gotta use what you have you know to kind of like um make your way so that's that's what i do and i think that because of that and because that is like in my genes and it's something that i used to do in my day-to-day -day life you know sometimes something breaks in your house and you don't have money to call like an electrician or something. And then you just kind of go in there, and, like put a tape to it and kind of make it work. That's what you do because you have to make it work somehow. And I think that that's what I bring to my um, job every day. When, when I have challenges like this or things that I don't know how to solve, I just figure it out because that's what I've been doing my whole life. Um, as a Mexican. So I think that that's how I incorporate um, my heritage into a technical job like like it's rigging. I love that answer. It goes back to the citas of la gana. At the end of the day, you know, got to go up and do it. Steph, if you want to take it away, um, is there a way you could, um, in incorporate your heritage into your work? Well, my, my work is quite technical as well because it's um, – it's everything that has to do with physics, and um, I don't uh, do. Uh, yeah, it's technical, but uh, I, I really definitely feel that <laughs> um, Mexican culture—it's uh, so colorful and so full of like forms. So that definitely influenced me to some uh, to some extent. But oh, as Jenny said, yeah. Uh, figuring out how to make things work. That's something really Mexican that I, I, I don't, well, yeah, it's something really, really Mexican. And there's something called guerrilla, guerrilla animation, that it's making, it's about making uh, animations with like not so much, uh, I don't know, tools, like a, not a huge render farm or stuff like that. And yeah, bringing that to, to to, to your to your belt it's 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 uh it's definitely yeah uh, powerful I don't know <laughs> <laughs> you're good no it's very important you know I feel like people always talk about the creative side of the work but you know it is a mental thing we do as well you know it is a job at the end of the day but how we approach things you know como haces al trabajo todos los días you know so we are sustainable and we last and we still stay motivated is very key a lot of that is rooted in our culture and how we were grown up and how we were raised Yves, if you want to take it away, um, because I know that you and I have also spoken together in Spanish at work as well, so we do incorporate a lot of that. Well, yeah, yeah, definitely. I think we, we took advantage of every time we saw someone that was uh, Latin, we'll be like, eh, eh, come here, aquí, aquí, vente, español. Yeah. <laughs> so I think I agree with all of you guys, Jenny, Monique, and Steph. It's like the same for me. Talking about the Me Mexicanada, Mexicanada uh, I joke a lot uh, with my boyfriend and say, you know, like, wait, I'm going to make Mexican math when I'm trying to solve something. Or like, hey, 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 you know, I'm, I'm, because I'm a lighter, right? So I'm lighting something, I'm like, mm, it, needs, it needs some spices. Like, I, I need to put some guacamole and chili into this lighting. So I, it's a joke, but I do it that a lot. Even when I'm talking to another lighter, I'm like, ah, you need some chili in there, you know? <laughs> but I think um, 
I agree completely with the Mexicanada thing that we always try to solve things in any way. Like we need to make it work. And I think we're used to that coming from ex like working in Mexico. It's like, I need to deliver tomorrow. How do I make it work? Patch it, you know? Or like, like in my house, we used to have a Volkswagen sedan. You put a tape and that's done. You keep going with the car, right? So it's pretty much our, our culture. Another thing, um, as Maria was saying, is that we try to like, if there's anybody that speaks Latin at the studio, it's like, hey, you know, we are a community, we're a family here. Let's let's communicate and say hello. Another thing that I think I'm really grateful for the studio I'm working is that sometimes or constantly there's a screening, they will send a form for feedback, right? So it's like, hey, if I see, as Monica was saying, something that was underrepresented in my culture, it's part of my responsibility to say, you know what? I don't think this is correct. As a Latin person, I see this a little bit in a bad way or in a good way or something like that. If it's hurt, that's different. That's another story. But at least I think it's part of our responsibility if we have that opportunity to rise up or rise our voices up, right? And I will say that the last thing is the culture itself. I think we, we Latin people are lively and colorful, as Seth was saying. So that brings a lot to the team. I feel like at least in my team, we're only two Mexicans in the department, and it, you can sense when there's a Latin person in the team because either there's a lot of laughs, there's a lot of like, like good professional jokes, just in case. There's a lot of like uh, team working things, like hey, you know what? Hey, it doesn't matter. Let's go to, let's make a meeting just to have a coffee or a beer or a cheve, you know. And I think that's really important. That's something that not a lot of people understand or have seen but it's something that i notice when there's a latin person in a team the the, the ambience or the environment of the team changes a lot like a lot so it's an extra thing that we can bring to the table as latin people that is so true this is a different type of flavor when you're surrounded by um, tu gente, you know and they should ayuda tu gente. like you said it is bringing awareness, you know, whether it's your responsibility to call out things um, appropriately, of course, when it's asked for or when it's due, but also, you know, finding um, your people at the studio is greatly important as well, which is awesome. And we're going to jump on over to our next question. We're going to have Seth start us off on this one. What would you say to Latinx artists that are trying to find their own voices, whether in rising in the industry or if they're in the industry now, um, and for all of our Spanish speakers out watching? Um, yeah, well, uh, don't stop studying. You have to study a lot and keep studying because this is technology at the end of the day. And yeah, you have to be up to date like all the time. And then, yeah, just think of what you want and search for it. Like, don't think that you will never get to the point that you want to think that you will and just work for it. Study, study a lot. Don't really, don't stop studying. I, I, I keep studying like monthly. I take classes. I, yeah, don't stop studying. Never, ever. Because this is technology. And yeah, have, have faith. <laughs> work a lot. Work, work a lot and have a lot of faith. Yeah. Yes. Muy verdad, trabajando mucho y estudiando mucho y el data está muy importante también. If you want to kick it off next, Jenny, let us know what you think you would tell people as they're rising up. Well, for me, I will say uh, don't give up, don't lose hope. Uh, when, I, when I started, um, uh, there was a period of, um, of my life where I went to L.A. to study at No Moon. And I loved it so much that I wanted to stay there. So I applied to many, many studios and I got a lot of interviews that went really well. And they were like, yes, we want you, please like start this internship. And everything always like kind of like failed when we got to the point or like, oh, you need a visa? Oh my God, no, yeah, we cannot do it. Especially for like a junior artist that's gonna start right now. So we normally do that for like senior people. And like, it, it was a common thing, you know? I, I used to get like the emails response and like the interview and everything was doing going great, great, great with all the studios until the visa point. 
And one, one time a, a studio was willing to do the visa for me and they did it. And then the visa got denied. And I was like, oh my God, you know, like I was so disappointed and frustrated because it's, it's something that y you cannot change. You can't work on that, you know, like if it's like, oh, you know, you're missing, maybe you should work more on this detail or on this part. If it's something that is in your hands to change it, then you, you just work on that and improve and you have hope that eventually you're going to get better and, and you get the job. In this case, it was something that was out of my hands. I couldn't solve it. I was like, what do I do? You know, what's the point? So then I got, I got so frustrated and so sad and I stopped applying for years. And I said, okay, you know, I'm just going to stay in Mexico. I'm going to still do uh, animation, but I'm going to stick with my country. And, you know, there's, there's no point. So don't do that. Don't do that because eventually it happens. If you keep trying and trying and pushing and pushing and pushing, it happens. You know, I, I, it, it took a while for me. I kind of like gave up and stayed a, a couple of years in Mexico working in animation. And it's a good thing that I did because I also, you know, it's a different way of doing things. And I learned a lot being in Mexico. But eventually I got that... Um, thing again saying like maybe I should try again see what happens you know if they say no they say no it's okay like I, I already you know the no you already have it so what can I lose maybe I should try it was more like an emotional thing you know I didn't want to have like that hope up and then oh no your visas and I was like oh damn it it's so hard but after a couple of years, I decided to try again. And I said, okay, you know, I'm just going to give it a try. I have a good job. You know, if, if it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. And I'm, I'm fine with it now. And then I got a, a, a job in Canada. And I'm here now. I've been here for like five years. Now I have PR and things are great. So even, even if you're facing a hard time and you're kind of like facing a lot of problems that you think you cannot solve don't do what i did and don't give up keep trying because eventually dreams come true so that, that would be my advice yeah it's definitely true you know it's all timings right but you got to be prepared for that timing uh, if you want to take it away monica let us know what you would say to our future latinx artists Oh, yeah. Like, it's, I mean, basically, like, echoing, like, what um, has already been said. But I think a big thing, too, kind of, like, touching on what Jenny said was, you know, that you can't be afraid to try. Because I've seen a lot of people, like, say, oh, I want to be, like, a board artist. And so people will be like, great, like, show me your portfolio. And they're like, I don't really have one. And it's like, well, how do you know you want to be a designer or a board artist or a background painter or whatever if you haven't done it? Like, it's very easy to say, oh, I want to do that. Um, but you have to try doing it like your own stuff because you might try it and be like, I hate this. Like, I don't want to be a board artist, but what I love about like trying my board was designing the characters. And so then that kind of pushes you in a different direction. You're like, Oh, actually I want to do that instead. Um, and I know that because I made the same mistake. Like I sat there and was like, I want to be a board artist. And then I was like, telling people I wanted to do it, but I didn't really have a portfolio because I was like, Oh, I don't know how to do it. So I can't show anyone anything because it's not good enough you know and I think a lot of us as artists think like oh it has to get to this certain point to justify me showing this to anyone you know because I don't want them to look at it and be like this person sucks like but we were all there at one point like you know you I think social media has a lot to do with that where people post like their best work and it's like yeah okay but how many hours did it take them to do that like how many tries did it take them you know it's not like they just magically woke up one day and like created this piece. And some people, yes, are very naturally talented. And for them, it's a lot easier. It's a lot faster. And for others of us, it takes a while. Like it took me a while, like a few years to get an internship in animation, just to like get my foot even in the door. And for me, it was just a lot of like trial and error. It was a lot of trying and trying and trying again. And there's moments where, yeah, you are thinking like, maybe this isn't going to work. Like at what point do I stop? But you know, you're not going to know if you don't try. And a lot of it is like, honestly, there's so much in this industry that ties into, can you take direction? Like, are you a team player? Can you play well? Can you 
pivot when we ask you to pivot. So if you're someone who, you know, you show your work and you get a portfolio review that's like, no, this isn't quite up to where it needs to be. You need to work on like X, Y, and Z. Can you show us that you can do that? That's your opportunity to go back, rework your stuff, try again, and then reach out again and be like, hey, here, I tried it. Like, is this closer now? Is this more, you know, what I need to work on? And then like, if you show us that, yeah, you did it, then it's like this person can take direction. Like maybe you're not quite at the level yet to like hire you into an artist position, but maybe it's like, oh, we could hire this person as an intern. Like, oh, we could hire this person as a production assistant. Like there's different ways to get into these positions that I think a lot of people sometimes aren't aware of. Like, I think a lot of people get blinded into thinking like it's an art position. So I got to shoot like straight for that top position. It's like, there's a lot of rungs you got to climb first Mm -hmm. before you can even get to that. And you'll be a stronger artist for it because you'll see, yeah, there's some artists that come straight out the gate and just get the top position, but maybe their next gig, there's no like storyboard artist opening. There's just a revisionist opening. So they need to jump into that. And then kind of unlearn the things they learned as a board artist and relearn things in order to be a revisionist. They're two different jobs. So if you've already done the work of going from the bottom and all those steps, you have that at least in your arsenal. So it ends up being a good thing sometimes that you had to kind of take the slower way. So Um, don't, don't worry about it. No, Monica, if I can ask you specifically, how how did you sort of mentally overcome the thing of like your self taught and oh yeah that was hard because like, I was I, like yeah go ahead oh no it was, it, was, it was hard because I had a lot of friends who went to Cal Arts. like so at the same time I was like in college in my dorm room and all my friends were posting like oh I'm taking a storyboard class oh I, like these are my panels and I was like is I had so many questions I was like is there a specific size aspect ratio for the panels like what are you working in is that china marker are you working digitally like what photo like is that photoshop like it was hard. A lot of it was, there was a lot of self-doubt. I can tell you that right now. There's, and it still continues. There's still like things that, you know, like every artist I think will tell you, oh my God, there's the imposter syndrome is so huge real. because yeah. it's real. It's, and I thought maybe it would go away the, the higher you go, yeah, but yeah, it doesn't, it never goes away. Like it I've never, met executive producers who are still like, I don't know, man. Like, I don't know what to tell you. So like, it's funny because we all, we're all ironically in the same boat. Every one of us thinks we're an imposter. It's like that video game where you're trying to find the imposter, but it's, it's literally all of us. So like, (laughs) you know, so so there's a lot of like getting out of that mental block. Cause I think when I, how did you, Monica, how do you fight out of that mental block though? Because that's a huge. Um, it's, that's a good question. Um, for me, Honestly, and this is something that I think um, I've talked about with some of my friends who are Hispanic, and we all realize the same thing. In the Hispanic community, there is not a lot of talk about therapy. There is not a lot of talk about mental health. Um, I was brought up to just be like, you just shotgun your way through it, and you just get the job done. But there comes a point sometimes where you're just like, this industry can be so unstable that it is helpful to talk to someone about it. So like going to see a therapist when you're like, I don't know if I'm doing a great job. The world is kind of chaotic. I have no idea like what my next gig is, like is a little bit of stability in our union because we we are part of a union, has a really good healthcare plan. So we've been telling, like the union told us at one point because they, I think the world just got so crazy that they were like, you guys should use your therapy. Like you have resources, please go to it. It's the copay is really low. So there's that. So that's helped like talking to someone that's not a friend who like, only who can see it from like a more impartial way because that kind of gives me a little bit more confidence where I'm like if I talk to my friends about it sometimes I feel like they're my friend they have to tell me that I'm not an imposter because they're my friend like but a lot of it also has come down to finding a mentor in the industry so like talking to my mentors who I trust because they know my weaknesses and my strengths so like I try I take their word you know truthfully if they tell me yes, you're doing fine. Don't worry about it. Like you, cause they've been in the same boat. So for them to be able to pass down like their experiences and like openly talk to me about like their like moments where they've had that self doubt or where they felt like they haven't been good enough to move up to the next level Mm -hmm. has been like super helpful. And then it's funny because like, then when my friends ask me, I'm like telling them and then I'm like, Oh, I learned this from my mentor. Like, so 
So that's another thing. If you have, you know, find people that you trust, if you can, and talk to them, don't be afraid to ask a question or send an email and just be like, I just want to pick your brain about this. Cause that's what I did when I started directing at Nick, I had no idea how to be a director. I was like, they don't teach you this in school. Um, so the first thing I did when I got there was like, I set up lunches with people that were directors and I was like asking them, like, how do you do this job? And, um, the funny thing was like, all of them, all of them were like, we don't know either. Like when we started, we just do what they tell us to do. Like you kind of find it as you go along. Like right. if you find some aspect of your job and it's new to you, come tell us because chances are we all started trying to figure it out. So it was all of us like finding out together and it makes the whole, it makes it seem much less scary when you realize we're all literally in the same boat here. Right. And so you're, your fears become more normalized, which is kind of nice. Like, so it's helpful, but yeah, it is scary. I'm not going to lie. There's there, you have to be self-motivated. There's a lot of, you, you can get down, but you have to go back up. Like a lot of the panelists were saying, you have to, you can't wallow in it. You have to try to find a solution again, because if you, if you try and you do your best, it's, that's all you can ask for. It's literally all we can ask for at the end of the day. Up. it's all about trying you know and the only way that you'll ever fail truly is if you don't try if you don't even get yeah. started you're definitely gonna fail Yvette if you want to wrap it up oh with our, man I your lovely with life. everybody <laughs> you know I would like to say three things uh the first one that is really important as well is that don't feel push or like you're in a in a race or anything like that to get somewhere because that's really important. I feel like I have met a lot of people, they're like out of school, and if they don't get the job of their dreams in the first year, they're getting super stressed and super sad, and then it is bad, right? So it's like, hey, you know, you're never late. You're never, ever late. doesn't matter if you're 18 or if you're 40, 50, or if you're changing careers. You have time to get to look for that voice and make it heard, right? And as everybody was saying, it says just keep trying and pushing and studying because the more tools you have on your side will help you to get there as well right but definitely don't compare yourself to anybody you have your own story and your own path and that's really important um that's one thing the second thing is like everybody who you see here i'm sure and, and you can tell me guys you can read yourselves and tell me i'm sure we have all failed and we have yes. all gotten back <laughs> up <laughs> yes I right? got right. fired from my first freelance gig. There yeah. you go. <laughs> so See, exactly. Exactly. So it's like, it's nothing like, don't be scared because you see people giving like these panels or people even above, like you were saying, Monica, CEOs and directors and executive producers and people really high. And if you haven't failed, I don't even know if, if that's true though. I feel like everybody fails. You go down, you go up and you keep going. So don't be afraid. Actually, don't even be afraid of failing. Sometimes from the failing, from the from the failures, you learn the most. So that's also really important. It's part of your story and your career. And there are stories that you can tell eventually, right? And then another oh, yeah. thing, right? It's like... Yeah, it becomes like a sharing. Like literally last night, I, I told someone like, oh, this is a story of like my first like big animation failure. And they're like, oh, dude, I have one. And they jumped in and we were like, oh, this is great. Like... Everyone has one. Every, but yeah, exactly. you learn. So yeah. I feel like that's really important for everybody to understand that no one is perfect. And even if you're the people that you admire so much, I'm sure they have so many stories. Like we can just convert this panel into storytelling between all of us and believe it's going to be a fun panel. I'm so sure. Oh, yeah. And the last thing is that about the imposter syndrome, which is so real. And it's interesting because I was telling this to another group um, on yesterday is that Kind of in Mexico, it was, I, I didn't feel it that much. But when I came here to the US, I just felt it immediately. And that was really interesting for me because I didn't even understand what was that feeling that I was getting when I came here and why it's always there. But I want to say something that is really important. If, if someone saw, if you got that position, if you got that job opportunity, if you got that a big huge opportunity to be a lead a director a producer a ceo is because someone trusts you someone thinks 
and believes in you and that they can see that you are not an imposter at all and you are there because of a reason. So if you got there, I think as you guys have been saying, it's like, well, the feeling will be there. I think it's part of being humans somehow. <laughs> so put it aside. Keep learning. I think Monica said something really important is that, you know, approach people, approach people, learn from everyone. It doesn't matter if it's up or down because everybody has a different story because of the failures and going up and you can learn from everyone and don't feel afraid of approaching people. I feel like I didn't do that when I was, I didn't do that enough when I was starting my career and I regret that a little bit because I feel like now I will be wiser. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but I feel like it's, that, it's really important to take away those fears and that ego. Sometimes some people feel like I can do this by myself. Yes, you can, but it may take you longer, right? So it's really important to, to create community and look for, as you're saying, mentors and other people to, to reach out. Yeah. Yep. Speaking of reaching out, we're going to start wrapping it up a little bit here. We had a couple mentee questions about suggestions of resources, but I do want to say Rise Up Animation is a great free resource to get portfolio reviews um, or just general informational or resume reviews as well if you just want to learn more about the industry. The application period will be opening back up at the end of the month, so make sure to follow us on all of our social media channels to check it out. And I don't know for sure, Bobby, but I think, don't we have a list somewhere of free resources, or have we not released that yet? Uh, yeah, I think we do have that list, and it's going to be, um, like, released soon, so. Awesome. So if you check us out on Instagram, find our email on one of our posts or on our link in bio, um, and it will actually email us, send us an email, or I think it might be there. Check us out, reach out to us if you need more information on that, because it's great to provide free resources. But concern, on the point of connecting with people, Jenny, if you want to start us off and tell us how we can connect with you, whether it's on LinkedIn, Instagram, whichever you prefer, especially for our attendees that are, you know, may want to ask some questions as well. Yeah, yeah definitely. You can find me on LinkedIn. You can look for me on Facebook. You can reach out on Instagram. Anywhere, just like, you know, like, you can email me. My email is jennyssd13 at gmail.com. So definitely reach, reach out to me if you are interested in uh, learning some rigging, if you want some feedback on your demo, or if you just want to chat, just reach out. Feel Take free. advantage, guys. Take advantage. Do it. <laughs> yeah, actually do it. It's a huge thing we've always been promoting on these panels. Actually reach out. Steph, if you want to take it away, how we, can we reach out to you? Oh, well, um, you can reach me at my LinkedIn. It's Steph Thomas. Or, uh, yeah, also you can write me an email. It's stf.thomas at outlook.de and uh, yeah, just you can ask me whatever. Awesome. Monica, if you want to take it away? Yeah, so I think the best way to find me, I'm on LinkedIn. Um, I don't check it as much as I should. Um, so like, I'm on Instagram though. So it's at Monica C. Davila on Instagram. Um, and then also my email is monica.c.davila at gmail.com. Um, so yeah, any questions you guys have about storyboarding or just general industry advice, like feel free. Awesome. And I will say everyone definitely get a LinkedIn if you don't have one, because it's a great way to hit people up also to search for people by their discipline. If you're looking for someone with a specific discipline as well, Yvette, if you want to take it away and wrap it all up with your lovely information, you look excited. <laughs> Sorry, I was doing something because you guys are amazing at spelling stuff, <laughs> but I have nice <laughs> Lexi. <laughs> and I'm really bad at doing that. So yeah, I mean, also feel free to reach me out my email. I'm just going to post it. There you go. Everybody got it now. Yeah, let's post <laughs> our emails. That's easier. Yeah. So you can reach out. I, I'm putting the Rise Up animation because somehow I've been more organized with that one compared to all my other emails. And that's like mainly for mentorships. And if you guys want to talk about lighting or send me your also like to review anything, uh, it's pretty cool. Uh, my my Instagram optical forest about my that's my personal Instagram, but I do a lot of weird photography. So if anybody's interested, <laughs> you can contact me there. But also Facebook, I think I'm pretty much all the time there. If you add me on Facebook, just send me a private message message saying that you saw this conference because I get a lot of robots and weird people, and I'm afraid of that. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm really open with Facebook, so just send me a message like, hey, add me, and then send me a message saying, hey, I saw you at the Rise Up thing. So I can add you guys, because otherwise, I don't. That's a, 
very good, good point to bring up. I tell everyone if they're going to connect with me on LinkedIn, um, send a message. Tell me why you want to connect. Tell me where you came from. Um, sometimes I may not be the right person to talk or give to you, advice to you. And same with our panelists as well. You know, um, they, the discipline you might be interested in may be completely opposite of what they're doing. And maybe they could point you to the person um, yeah. who can actually help. So definitely always introduce yourself. Explain, uh, you know, what you're looking for as well, and also, you know, maybe tell us your favorite donut or something. And just in case well. you're thinking, I'm really bad at answering. Don't do like, oh man, this is not advice, guys, because I, I'm really bad at LinkedIn. That I have lost so many opportunities, and it's sad. And I need to learn about that because I have lost the opportunity to be a supervisor many, many times. No. <laughs> oh. So I need to learn. Reach out in the other media. But that's not advice, guys, because then you're like, life happened, and I was not there. <laughs> yeah, awesome. no, I, I, uh, no, that's great. Um, yeah. And, and that's not good advice. Be political, but um, everybody votes. Everybody, um, as as we're kind of like closing out, everybody, votes, okay. everybody wear their masks. Um, and I hope you saw the uh, the debates and made a made a decision on <laughs> thing. But like, vote, oh, wear your mask. And uh, mm-hmm. Glendale, Glendale, where I live, does give shit about masks. So I'm like, please, people, come on. <laughs> wear their masks. Uh, and, yeah. Um, I mean, like, you know, I mean, like, a, you know, um, Rise Up doesn't get, doesn't really necessarily get into the, uh, uh, political aspect of it, but like I think this is pretty clear, <laughs> like where we need to go. So, uh, mm-hmm. like everybody, please uh, like vote and uh, watch the watch the uh, debates and and see how fucked up it is. <laughs> and, uh, now in Spanish, Bobby. Yep. Yeah, no, that's okay. <laughs> what did you learn, Bobby? We tried. We tried here so far. <laughs> yeah, just see how fucked up it is and, and let's support let's support like everybody. Let's support the non white supremacists. Um I um let's support like everyone in Latina uh, uh Latinx uh like Heritage Month and so I'm I mean you know, we stand with everybody. So, like, um, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, I know. Let's do porque estamos una familia por aquí en Rise Up y necesitas ayuda tu persona que está trabajando contigo as well. And actually, I would like to say there something you. else. Uh, for those that apply to Rise Up, I think I, I have put it in every single Facebook page I have found from Latin America. Jenny, probably everybody has seen. <laughs> I'm like, always. <laughs> everybody come on guys so if you don't feel comfortable with english there's a lot of latin amazing artists in there and talent Mm -hmm. that you can just say hey my english is bad but is there anybody that is willing to speak to me in my own language and i think again don't feel afraid to ask because it's from everywhere in the world it's amazing it's super cool well i mean in in the beginning rise up animation is meant to support um (laughs) everyone people of color and give them a chance to um, get into the animation industry and promote diversity and inclusion for our future in the rise of animation um, and the animation industry. So like, um, I have no problem uh, denouncing Trump, Uh, whatever, like whatever your um, political leanings are. So I I, I just wanna support um, Latinx communities at this point, right? That's the most important thing. It's the most important thing. So. Yeah, and like you were saying, yeah, like, you know, if you, if you're like, dude, I want to get into the industry and I like English is not my first language. um, Like Bobby was saying, like, we want to support diversity. We want to support. um, We're not going to sit here and be like, eh, sorry, bye. Like, because you don't speak English, like, yeah, no. reach out to us. And yeah. if, like, like for instance, like, my Spanish isn't the greatest, um, but, like, I have friends who are pro at speaking Spanish. So it could be both of us, like, doing a Zoom call with you and being, like, all right, let's try, like, between the three of us, like, we can, you know, find a way to get you the information or answer your questions, you know. And at the end of the day, like, there's Google Translate. 
I can, yeah. like, we can, we, you know, there's, it's, it, there's, it's not impossible. Like, we should take down these barriers, you know, to, like, to people being able to get into the industry. So there are ways. So don't yes. worry about it. As a fun fact, I found a amazing Japanese grocery store that I've been trying everything that I cannot read. I buy it because I just want to try different flavors. That crazy I can be. But Google Translate, amazing. I'm learning so much from that picture thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so definitely. Brad. Awesome. Thank you so much, everyone. You All of our attendees. Again. Yes, make, make sure to check out our panel next Saturday because we'll be doing Latina Journeys in Production. So it's going to yeah. be pretty cool. We're going to continue the series and the Latina power going, um, or Latina representing as well. But thank you so much as well, everyone, for coming on. And thank you so much to our panelists. We give them a big round of applause. We can applause each other. It's great. Thank you guys so <laughs> much. Thank time. you so much. So much. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Hey. Yeah. Thank you so much for tuning in, everyone, especially those of you out of the country. I still appreciate the Philippines coming in at 2 a.m. It's amazing. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Thank you Columbia. guys so much. Appreciate it. I love you guys, and we'll see you guys soon. Awesome. Bye, everyone. Bye bye. bye. Adios. Bye. Adios. Yes, yeah. claro. <laughs>